Hello everyone. I wanted to start out this class with a brief presentation on exactly what is history? How is history done? Why is history important? Well first, what is history? Now of course, the standard definition of history is that it's the study of the past, which sort of goes without saying. But even more importantly than that, it's also the study of the present. How humankind and its societies have changed over time to reach the present moment in time. And that is really key because at its core, history really is the study of that change over time. Now also, I like to refer to history as sort of the mother discipline, if you will. Art, science, especially the social sciences, things like psychology, anthropology, sociology, things of that nature, uh, literature, and even math are all based in, derived from history and historical processes to some extent. And this is really, for me personally, why I love history so much, because it really is sort of that umbrella discipline underneath which all other academic disciplines rest. Now, if you haven't already, I would like for you to take a few moments, pause this recording, um, and go and view the three YouTube videos I posted within the same folder that you found this presentation. Those videos will elaborate a little bit further on some of the things that I'm talking about here and we'll be talking about over the course of this class. Um, so, again, if you haven't already, take a moment, pause this recording, go watch those videos, and then come back and rejoin us here. So, how is history done? Now, history is generally done by studying historical sources. And there's two main types of sources that historians use and that we'll be looking at over the course of this class. First, primary sources. Now, primary sources are first-hand accounts of a topic from people who had a direct connection with it. So, people who lived during the time and place of a particular historical event under investigation. Uh, over here on the side of this slide, I have posted uh, a few examples of some historical sources, some primary sources. This first one here is just a handwritten letter. That would be considered a primary source. Over here is a document, uh, Common Sense, by Thomas Paine, a very important document written during the American, uh, American Revolution that had a profound effect on the development of that particular historical event uh, and something we will certainly be taking a look at during the course of this class. Uh, down here we have an example of a birth certificate. This would also be considered a primary source. And then over here we have a newspaper, something else that would be considered a primary source. Now, these are, aren't the only examples of primary sources. These are just a few examples, just to give you a general idea of what a primary source is and some of the things that historians look at and that we will be looking at during this course. Now, secondly, you have secondary sources. Now, secondary sources are generally scholarly books and articles. A secondary source interprets and analyzes primary sources. These are sources that are one or more steps removed from the event in question. Now a great example of a secondary source would be your textbook. Uh, another example would be the scholarly work that you will be asked to read as part of the movie book project which is the major uh, writing assignment in this particular course. Now, I want to discuss with you some important aspects of developing historical knowledge, some ideas and terms that I'll be referring to over the course of this class that I want you to keep in mind as we are moving through this course and studying history. First, historical actors. Now, that term conjures up in your mind ideas of, you know, people or persons, and that is certainly the case. However, historical actors are not merely people or persons. There are also places, things, and even ideas that influence the direction of historical processes. Now, very importantly, context. Context is key when studying history. 
Context includes the social, religious, economic, and political conditions that existed during a certain time and place. Now, understanding the context in which historical actors acted can inform us about why they acted and reacted the way that they did during a particular historical event or process. Also, perspective. Every historical actor, and when I use that term in this context, I am talking about people or persons, has a unique perspective that influenced their interpretation of events, actions, processes. Now, historians take into account all possible perspectives when building or generating historical knowledge and interpretations of historical events. There's rarely, if ever, merely one or two perspectives. There's three, four, five, six, sometimes dozens or more perspectives that all kind of converge. And I liken it to a spider web that, you know, you've once historians gather all those together, form a more balanced interpretation of particular historical events or processes. Another key thing to keep in mind is bias. Now, the standard definition of bias is an inclination or outlook to present or hold a partial perspective, often accompanied by a refusal to consider their possible merits of alternative points of view. Now, everyone is biased to some degree or another. As human beings, we just can't escape this. The context, the social, economic, political, religious, etc., of each individual's upbringing and or worldview affects how they interpret the world around them. Now, good historians seek to account for their own biases as well as the biases of the sources that they study. Now, it is impossible to be completely unbiased. Good historians, however, attempt to be as unbiased as is humanly possible. And one of the ways that they do is, is by taking into account those multiple and myriad perspectives that converge in that spiderweb type way to inform a, that more balanced interpretation of history. Now there's two different types of biases. There's the explicit bias, which is something that operates on a conscious level. It is expressed directly and the people expressing it are often completely aware of this particular sort of bias. Then there's implicit bias, which is operates at a subconscious level is expressed indirectly and most of the time people expressing it are often completely unaware of their particular bias that they have towards this whatever particular thing is under examination. Now both of these things are definitely at play when we are studying history and part of a historian's job is to try to discern both those explicit and implicit biases that kind of run underneath the actual words on the printed page or in a recording that the historian is examining to try to form that interpretation and that analysis of historical processes and events. And to discern those biases is often very difficult, but is a key aspect of good historical investigation. Lastly, I want to discuss with you the difference between historicism and presentism. Now, historicism is an attempt to understand the peoples of the past on their own terms, within the context of their culture, their particular morals, their particular set of values, their biases, etc. Now, this is not meant to excuse the negative aspects of the past, but rather an attempt to understand the how, and even more importantly, the why such things occurred the way that they did. Now, presentism is an attempt to place the values and morals of the present onto peoples of the past. Now, good historians avoid presentism. One key thing that we must keep in mind is that Humans have not always thought, 
felt or acted the way that people do today. And this is often something that modern people have a hard time wrapping their heads around. We like to think that our particular set of values or morals are universal and have existed throughout time. Well, this is just not the case. And again, I refer back to that core definition of history as the study of change over time to inform the way we think about past peoples and events and understanding that they often felt thought and acted very, very differently than the way we would to particular events. That is key to understanding historical peoples on their own terms. Now lastly, I want everyone to understand that history is complex and very, very nuanced. Rarely, if ever, is history simply black and white, one thing or the other, but rather it is infinite shades of gray. Now I hope over the course of this class, what I'm referring to here will become more and more clear to you as we move through the study of American history. Well, that's all for this particular presentation. As always, as anyone, if anyone has any questions or concerns, do not hesitate to contact me. In the meantime, study hard, and I'll see you soon.